everyone should be open to the information changing because that's what science does, it evolves. And so you're gonna see scientists change their approach over time, all good scientists do. And trainers should as well, right? Think about how we used to train back in the day and how we train now. I mean, things evolve and change. And if you're doing the same thing you were doing back then, you know, without any change, then, you know, it's arguable that you're behind. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today has over 25 years of experience on how to best fuel the body through informed nutritional choices. A successful author, creator of several weight management programs, and the vice president of nutrition for DotFit, she's on a mission to empower people to create lifelong positive habits to support optimal health and longevity. What would you say from your experience is the, the main reason why diets tend to fail. Humans are creatures of habit, <laughs> and diets expect people to change their habits overnight. Knowing what to do is one thing, how to do it is a whole different story. Execution's everything. You can have the perfect plan, but if you don't execute, then it doesn't make a difference. There are some studies that have done that exercise is just as equally effective as, as um, antidepressants. That's a key thing for trainers is making exercise fun for people. If you don't drink, don't start. I believe protein has to be prioritized for everybody. So please join me in welcoming Kat Bearfield to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Kat Bearfield. Yes. Thank you for in, in, inviting me to your wonderful house. And we've got the love sign going on. And I think this sets the scene <laughs> very does, nicely. It does, it does. Yeah, no, thank you for coming. It's an honor to be part of your podcast. Yeah, so we've so we got, we got buckets that also is going to ch yep. chime in if we, if we need some support. Buckets of love. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about nutrition and mm -hmm. it's an interesting subject, one that I guess people in this day and age not only struggle with but they, they get extremely confused by is, is my guess. Yeah and attached. And it's attached. almost like politics sometimes. I, yeah <laughs> right? yeah you're right actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you have a camp of of this, I was, I was talking to someone the other day, and um, yeah, it is, it is like almost like you're in, you're either in this group, or, or you're not, regardless of whether it works or not. Right, it's, it's very interesting in that regard. How do you you work with lots of trainers and and mm -hmm. educate them on nutrition? Mm -hmm. How how do a lot of the clients that that you talk to, which are professionals, how do they um, look at nutrition as a tool? So the professionals that I get to work with, whether it's an athlete or um, an actor or so, and such, you know, they look at it as a tool and they want to know how to optimize it to get to where they want to go, whether it's for a movie or a photo shoot or for athletic performance. Um, and, you know, regular clients do that too. Gen pop is what we call it. They want to do the same, use it as a tool. Um, and trainers tend to get fixated on one way or the other, and then that gets passed down to their clients, and that's where all the <laughs> confusion maybe get, gets in. But it's a, it's a powerful tool, as you know, you know, and most people who walk into our facilities, into our gyms, they need it. And so as a, as a, as a fitness professional, and I think as an industry, we have a responsibility to get real clear on what works, what doesn't, you know, what could potentially be harmful. So, you know, it's an opportunity for all of us, I think, to level up. From an education perspective, is it, is it difficult when you're working with other professionals to, to, I guess, maybe, I'm not sure whether combat's the right word, but offset a lot of what is out there on social media now and po podcasts where uh, there's, every kind of expert saying this is what you should and shouldn't do. And, and I, I guess as a professional organization that you're part of where you do have a curriculum and you do a lot of your own research. I know Neil is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is a crazy scientist where it comes from that perspective. But obviously having to only release information when it has been properly checked and it's, and it's yes. correct. How, how, do you, how do you balance the latest podcast with a real curriculum around nutrition? You know, we do that with evidence. What does the science say? What does the research say? And if we can get people to take the emotion out of it, right, and to sort of have an open mind, talk a little bit about, okay, mechanisms, does this actually make sense, back it up with some data and research, then it gives the trainers a little bit more clarity. Okay, I get that. You know, because you explain, you break it down from a scientific perspective, and then this is what the, what the research shows 
But if somebody is not open-minded, they're emotionally attached, if you will, to a certain method, then yeah, you're going to have a problem like trying to overcome objections or barriers or beliefs, if you will. So, I mean, everyone should be open to the information changing because that's what science does. It evolves. And so you're going to see scientists change their approach over time. All good scientists do. And trainers should as well, right? Think about how we used to train back in the day and how we train now. I mean, things evolve and change. And if you're doing the same thing you were doing back then, you know, without any change, then, you know, it's arguable that you're behind. What do, you, what do you think is a good way of dealing with that? So I guess from a trainer to a client and from an educator to a trainer, when, when something comes up and it's maybe there could be a slight conflict with some of the information that you're giving, how have you found is, is a good way to, to deal with that in, in, and, uh, yeah, and, 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 and sort of still maintain a level of professionalism with, with what, what's been presented? Yeah, so obviously no insults, <laughs> right? And again, going back to being open-minded and not emotionally attached. And then really, you know, as a fitness professional, you have to be educating yourself continuously. So um, at Dot Fit, one of the things I get to do is teach trainers on a monthly basis, all different organizations about various topics related to nutrition. And we invite for free people to come and attend our workshops and we hold them every month or organizations hold them every month. And when we can educate them properly, show them the data, explain things, break them down on their level, then it's easier to combat the misinformation, right? So it's an ongoing thing. It's always happening. And then what we have is something called experts, our experts team, if you will, that's open to all trainers. And so they can email us their, their questions and we answer those and publish those on an ongoing basis as well. So a lot of times you don't know. As a trainer, you don't know the information because nutrition is not your expertise. So if you, But if you give them a, a resource, um, I don't know the answer, but I'll find out. That's a great way to respond to something related to nutrition. I don't know, but I'll go find out. Right. And then you have a team of experts, experts, if you will, um, that can go dig up the information or the science and get the questions answered. But once again, it's an ongoing learning process. And from uh, your organization then, it, it, is that part of how your, um, I guess, a good partner to work with? Because you're, 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 it's, it's a fairly regular communication yeah. with, with, with the you know, with, with your trainers? On, yes. Okay. Yes. So, so what we do at DotFit, we partner with different, different gyms, right? We have a nutrition software system that generates nutrition plans, whether it's weight loss or muscle gain or performance or just general health. And it comes up with calorie targets, protein targets, different menus, um, supplement recommendations. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to give our trainers a tool that they can utilize to deliver to their clients without having to know everything about nutrition. Right, And part of that process, we start with a certification. So our certification is four hours. Um, it's been approved by organizations like the NASM, AFA, even um, for the, from the Commission of Dietetic Registration that oversees education for dietitians like myself. So we try to provide a baseline education around nutrition. And then on, every single month, we invite them in. They get to choose the topic. We tell them, what do you want to learn about this month? Do you want to learn about creatine? Do you want to learn about optimizing body composition? Do you want to learn about popular diets? And we put together content based on the research. And then we have a monthly educational webinar for the various organizations that we partner with. Because once again, at the end of the day, who, this, who is this about? This is about the members that come into our industry, right? They're desperate for a solution. They want to lose on average, what would you say, 15 or 20 pounds, the average person. They need nutrition, right? Are most of the stats show that about 84% of gym members are taking at least one dietary supplement. Who's guiding them? TikTok influencers? I'm not knocking you if you're one, if you're an influencer. But we can all agree it's not necessarily the most credible source of information. So we try to be that go-to source. You know, starting with a basic certification that's proven incredible and then ongoing education. And like I said earlier, our um, team of experts that they have 24-7 access to, to to email their questions in. But if you don't have an open mind, right, you think you knew everything or you believe everything that's on TikTok or Instagram, in my opinion, you're part of the problem, spreading your misinformation. So you have to get a steady you know, diet, if you will, of credible information. And of course, there's 
good certifications out there in regards to nutrition. There's not so good, just like in personal training. So it's a bit of a betting process in that regard as well. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. What do you think uh, the role of a trainer is? Or what, what, do, what, do you, what do you think the role of nutrition education is for the trainer? It, it, I know for different reasons, those things tend to be quite separate. Yeah. However, everybody I talk to in the industry, it's like, okay, well, you, those, those two kind of are totally married, joined at the hip. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you navigate that and what's your, you've been in, in the industry for a long time, what, what's your experience of the, of the best way you've seen it working? Yeah, okay, let me talk about what it's not. Like the role of fitness professional is not medical nutrition therapy, it's not diagnosing or treating a disease or a medical condition, right? That's for clinicians and practitioners like a dietitian or a physician, etc. So it's not that. But then think about the general population who comes in. They want to lose 15, 20 pounds, they want to get stronger and healthier. That's what that is. So what does that entail? Well, what are the credible principles of nutrition, right? How do you actually lose weight? What is, how does that work in the body? What diets are effective? What diets are not effective? What supplements are effective? What supplements are not effective? How do you help your clients develop habits and give them tools, right, around better eating choices? Um, around taking a properly made dietary supplement. What is a properly made dietary supplement? Do you even know that? So I think that sort of encompasses the realm of nutrition for a fitness professional, proper weight management, what are evidence-based supplements, what are credible ways for people to lose weight, what diets are credible or not, what fads are not, and what about myths? There's so many myths and mis misinformation. Being able to dispel myths, and again, not necessarily knowing everything, but having a good team or, you know, base a body of research that you can tap into, you yeah. know? Yeah. What would you say from your experience is the, the main reason why diets tend to fail? Um, because hum humans are creatures of habit <laughs> and diets expect people to change their habits overnight, forever, <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. The average, in our, in our country, most people consume around 55% carbohydrates, around 30% fat, and 15% so protein. I mean, that's the, where the numbers wash out, approximately. And then someone wants to follow a ketogenic diet. 50 grams a day of carbohydrates, max. 5 to 10% max. How do I do that? You know what I mean? For the rest of my life? Like, that's, it's very overly restrictive, and it's, it's going against human nature. Unless, for some reason, you're somebody who's highly motivated and you can get yourself to white knuckle it. And those people tend to be someone who just got divorced or has had a heart attack or saw a health scare or something like that, right? Or maybe they've a, another triggering event, if you will, seeing yourself in the mirror for the first time or a picture of yourself and you're like, oh my God, I got to change. So unless you're like that, highly motivated for some reason, then, um, or you're an actor or something getting paid $50 million, right, to be in a movie... Um, then you're not going to be able to stick to a, a plan or, or a method that's asking you to change your habits overnight. It's just not a sustainable approach. So how much of what you do is working on the mental side of diet as well as providing meal plans and suggestions? Yeah. So for our gyms, we provide the plan, overall plan, if you will. How many calories do you need to consume? What do you burn? How much protein? What supplements are good for your body, et cetera? Um, and then, we have, of course, we partner with trainers who do the exercise program part. So we provide the plan, if you will. And then it's sort of an ongoing process coaching trainers on how to coach their clients, right? That's like an ongoing thing. How do you actually develop habits? How do you actually help your clients set goals, proper behavioral goals? 
Um, so we do that with, through our monthly education, but again, that's an ongoing thing as well. Mm. Is that, would you say that that's a, a big part of the success is, is more, less, less about the, and I'm not, I'm not playing down how important it is to get the right type of diet, but yeah. would, if, if you had to put a percentage, what percentage would it be in helping them put in the right habits and, and things to do when you're tempted to reach for the sugar as opposed to the mm -hmm. piece of protein. Yeah, I mean, knowing what to do is one thing, how to do it is a whole different story. A lot of people know what to do, they don't do it. Yeah, right. that's my, that's my experience. <laughs> yeah, they don't do it. Why don't they do it? For a variety of reasons, stress, like you said, um, it could be family cultural forces, it could be lack of knowledge, lack of skills in regards to food prep, you know, there's a lot of different reasons. And that's why, you know, people make fun of me. They're like, whenever I ask you a question, you say it depends. And it context is everything because everyone's different, right? Their preferences, their cultures, the way they're raised, their habits. But going back to your story, I'm sorry, your question, um, execution's everything. You can have the perfect plan, but if you don't execute, then it doesn't make a difference. Mm, right. Yeah. With losing fat and 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 there's i guess there's two different ways of looking at it. there's well or, or there's, there's two different ways i'm going to describe it there's someone who's a bit overweight and wants to just reduce it and, yeah. and tone up and then there's the other people that are probably fairly toned but want to get like really ripped um are, are those are, in, in your world, are those two very, very similar things? And is it just more about, you know, how, how, how different would you approach those, those two different scenarios, I yeah. guess? Yeah, they are very different scenarios, but the principles are similar, right? The principles to getting lean, regardless of who you are, are the same. The strategies change depending on who you are, right? Okay. So if you're overweight or obese, um, we're now at 72, 74% of our populations have overweight or obese. 72%? Correct. Now. Overweight or obese, yeah. So, <laughs> And experts are predicted that will continue to increase. But um, a lot of that has to do with environment and lifestyle, right? And you got to tackle your environment that shapes your behavior um, and all the related things, whether it's stress or sleep or obviously food habits, etc., if you're someone who's already pretty lean and you want to get to the next level, you probably don't have your stuff dialed, right? So you're living a lifestyle that's supporting a very lean physique. And so now it's, you know, getting real specifics into the strategies of how to, you know, do whatever we need to do to get leaner to the next level, depending on your baseline intake of protein, how much you're moving, your overall diet, what supplements you're taking. So, you know, the principles still remain the same. If you want to get lean, what has to happen? You got to reduce your caloric intake, right? You got to force your body into a physiological imbalance so it loses body fat. You know, most lean individuals want to keep their muscle tissues. So you got to obviously optimize protein, you know, make sure your training is optimized as well. Um, but the principles are the same in terms of forcing the body into a physiological imbalance to lose weight. Strategies differ. Right, and and if if you were to simplify that, mm -hmm. then uh, is it um, is it generally down to the amount, the the volume, and the and the food types? Are, are those sort of the 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 general things that you look at, or is it? I'm sure it's more complicated than that. <laughs> but <I'm> just... <laughs> yeah, but at the same, to your point, um, it's simple but not easy. Mm. Right, there's a there's a difference between the two, so. What do we mean by that? Well, what has to happen on a simplistic level is you've got to reduce your caloric intake, regardless of size, if you're trying to get leaner and increase your expenditure. Like that's just, that's just how the phys physiology of the human body, right? Um, and then everyone's different. Like if an individual is consuming a lot of processed foods, right? High fat foods, then yeah, we can tackle that first if it, if it fits their you know, preferences and if they're willing to make that change. Um, and if it's, it's something else, maybe the individual is consuming you know, no carbohydrates and mostly dietary fat, then maybe we tweak it in that regard. So what I do is I like to see what is the client eating over the course of seven days? 
because pictures don't lie, <laughs> right? Um, and then it all comes to the client's willingness. What are you willing to tweak? Here's what I see. Here's what my eyes see in terms of your total intake. We can do this X, Y, and Z. And then you let the client sort of lead you because humans want autonomy. Most people resent when they're told what to do, right? Would you agree? Like, well, in regards to food, <laughs> with training, it might be different because when you're hiring a trainer, you're asking the trainer to tell you exactly what to do. But with food, they, they want to make their own choices and they've got to do it for life. So if you can, can lead it from that perspective, I think that um, it's effective because then they have autonomy and they can make those choices. So again, I'm answering your question. It depends on the mm. context. Is there, a, yeah. is there, a, is there a, a kind of a general good level that you want to be in terms of the amount of body fat that you carry? Is, is there an op optimal that everybody should strive to? Or is, is again, is it all dependent on on the individual. Well, yeah, from a health standpoint, you know, we have all these general body fat charts that tell us what's quote unquote healthy, right? It's healthy, yeah. But yeah. I suppose is there, is there like optimal as well? You know, it's like, the, I, I, because I, I see that, it's like, okay, well, I, I get why that's healthy, but is there something that you should kind of strive to, would you say? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think excess body fat is obviously a risk factor for all kinds of chronic diseases. So it depends on your age. Right, as you age, you can carry a little bit more body fat. But you know, in general, with women, you wanna be in the mid 20s or so. Guys, obviously lower, because they don't have to have babies or breastfeed. But you know, I think well, that- Well, nowadays they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I do think that, you know, there is a healthy ideal range for body fat um, for people to, you know, to strive for. What, what have you found is, is a, an effective tool for measuring that body fat? Oh man, that is a loaded question. I mean. <laughs> without, without upsetting anyone or sponsors or whatever, but <laughs> are, are there any uh, real you know, good, good tools that, that you, you tend to? Root? So, you know, skin, skin folds, if you're trained on how to use, um, you know, a, a skin dex or a skin fold measurement tool, um, that's probably the most reliable as long as you're, as you're trained. A lot of these other um, tools that you use, they're highly variable, especially if you compare them next to each other. Some use two co a two compartment model, three compartment, four, you know, so it all depends on um, the, the tool itself. And you can use each tool on the same person, like they could vary widely. <laughs> so I think the key thing is that you're using the same tool over and over again, and also to trust another way to measure it, like a circumference measurements, because that's, pretty reliable. You take a circumference measurement, if you're doing it the same way, the same landmarks across the body, then their circumference measurements will track over time, right? As opposed to another tool that has, let's say, two, three, four percent error every time you do a measurement, right? So I think maybe using two different ones, whatever you have, a skin dex, biological impedance, maybe you have a dexa or an in-body or these different tools, and then also using let's say circumference measurements. And how would you, how with circumference, so if you're building muscle as well, yeah. how, what, how do you, how would you do that then? Yeah, so with the, the obviously around your bicep, around your chest, around your glutes, your hips, your quads, your calf, you know, you would take those as well and see if you're seeing growth in those areas, mm -hmm. you know, along with your body composition right. tool. Okay, what about the, the differences in losing weight for men and women. Uh, yeah. What, what's... Yeah, it's what's easier that? for guys, that's all we have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. I mean, guys just, they, they, well, they have percentage-wise of muscle, they have more muscle tissue, obviously. Um, but I really haven't digged into the research, the difference in sex, sexes and, and why it's easier for males to drop weight than it is for females. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I it just, my, my experience is guys just tend to lose it a bit easier than, than women do. I don't know. Maybe someone out there can dig into the research and tell us what the reasons are. <laughs> what, do, do you think that the, the I'm, I'm not just women, but men, do, do you think hormones and things like that can affect how you burn, you know, you burn energy, processed foods? Do you, is, is that something you think plays into it at all? Well, certainly, certainly. So obviously we have the thyroid hormones, which directly influence our met metabolism and our metabolic rate. And when you look at hypothyroid, underactive thyroid, 
the, the majority of people with a hypothyroid are women. So yeah, it can definitely have a direct influence on weight management. Do we know why that's the case? A lot of people, you know, theorize about it. I mean, it has to do with stress and autoimmune disease and the relationship between the mind um, and and the the stress has on a cellular level that impacts your hormones. Um, but I don't think the answers are crystal clear in that regard mm. <laughs> at all. And do you, do you think emotion as well affects weight loss? Uh, you, like stress yes. and fear and yes. and worry. Yes, I mean. Yes. So when you talk, especially with women, when you work with women in weight management, a lot of them are so stressed out because women are asked to be all things to everybody, right? We got to work and we have to be the primary caregiver and we've got, you know, the, the household duties typically fall up along with the women. And where do they get stress release, relief from? Oftentimes it's food or wine or alcohol and relaxing as opposed to exercising, right? So emotion's huge. I think can it be? Can that be a vicious, end up being a bit of a vicious circle as it, well? It is. It is because food is reinforcing, alcohol is reinforcing, right? You're getting stress relief from it. So if if you don't find an out a different outlet or a different way to manage your stress, it absolutely is an ongoing vicious cycle, and you see a lot of that with moms going into middle age and then into menopause, etc. Do you, what, do you ever factor that in and address things like, or recommend people to, to address that? Or is, is some of that done via exercise? I think both. I think if you choose to exercise, then you're automatically going to get some stress relief, right? But it's getting people to <laughs> exercise and experience the stress relieving effect of exercise, as opposed to this is another thing that I have to do on my to-do to -do list. Mm. But... You know, there are some studies that have done that exercise is just as equally effective as, as um, antidepressants, you know, and so is it an effective tool? 100%. But I think the problem is, to some degree, is many times when people exercise, you know, they join a facility, they join a gym, and they start exercising, they don't like it. So they don't enjoy it. <laughs> So we got to get people to like exercise. How do we do that? Maybe you've got the, how do we get people to enjoy it on a regular basis? I think that's, that's a key thing for trainers is making exercise fun for people. Yeah, we, we had a interview. I do quite a few, so I, I can get confused who I'm talking to, but <laughs> um, it was a case of that there's, there's many different ways of doing that. Even right. the research behind something as simple as walking loaded with, with backpacks mm -hmm. on and things mm -hmm. like that for some people can be extremely powerful for someone who's not done anything. Right. And, and I, I guess, you know, to answer your question, I suppose it's, you know, are, are we sort of narrowing our views down on, on what it really should be? And, and, and I suppose a lot of times it has to be in a certain you know, a big building has to have certain things in that building and you have to do certain things like burpees <laughs> or whatever. And right. where really it probably isn't, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest predictor of people who exercise consistently is do they enjoy it and is it convenient for them to do, right? I would agree, yeah. Is it convenient? I mean, walking, walking is a great form of exercise, right? I have a treadmill desk. That's how, that's one of the things I use to, you know, keep my weight at a reasonable place but um that's the world we live in we have to create equipment to <laughs> move in order to do the work we have to do right to support our families mm. but back to your point um people have to like exercise to keep doing it and that will help them relieve stress you mentioned alcohol <laughs> what what's your views on that if you don't drink don't start <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my run. first one yeah um, I think that alcohol is used for many people, um, as a numbing device for stress and emotions and alcohol. I'll, I'll tell you a story. A friend of mine, when I was at a, I was at an event, um, a friend of mine was like, Kat, can you please tell me, you know, you, you stay in pretty good shape. You're over 50, you know, tell me, how are you, you know, keeping your weight under control? I, I eat well, I do this, I, I, I eat yogurt and berries in the morning and I take a walk, I'm always moving, I'm sitting down, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, that sounds pretty good. Eat a salad with a piece of salmon. And, and she's telling me her eating habits and that it's great. And then I'm like, all right, what happens on the weekend? 
was like, well, my son comes home every weekend and, you know, we drink tequila and we have a good time. I'm like, how much tequila? <laughs> She's like, well, you know, we do shots. Okay, shots. How, how much shots are you doing? Mm, I don't know, maybe, you know, five or six shots or so. How often are you doing that? Well, Friday and Saturday, sometimes Sunday too. Okay, so get your phone out. I want you to look up how much a shot of tequila is. One and a half ounces a shot. She's like, what? Tequila has calories? I thought that if you just took a shot, you just, <laughs> right? And so she looked it up. It was like, what, 110, 130 calories a, for a shot of tequila. And she, her, her eyes were like, oh, oh, I didn't know there were calories in tequila. I didn't actually. I thought tequila was the kind of like the best <laughs> right? one you could drink from a... I thought it was the, what the CrossFitters do. That's that's where I heard the story. Maybe it's some <laughs> bro science. <laughs> no, they all have cal they all have about equal number of hard liquor, right, per ounce. And many times people overlook the calories in alcohol mm. for some reason, or they underestimate what they do on the weekend compared to what they do during the week. And this is what this woman was doing. It was that she was doing great, right, with her exercise routine and her and her diet, et cetera. Then when it comes to the weekend. She was, then this is very common. Right? What about wine? What's that like a, if you have, say, a few glasses of wine? Is that the calories in that as well? Oh, yeah. And it takes more to get in, intoxicated, right? If you think about it, right? Because it's less alcohol per volume. So um, it's just, it's again, excess calories is going to prevent you from getting to your weight management goal, regardless of where they come from. It's just easier to compound out, you know, to drink a whole lot of alcohol, a whole ton of calories. Well, she was consuming, I think we calculated 1,600 to 2,000 calories in alcohol, and that's why she wasn't losing weight. Right. Yeah, you don't think about that. I, I notice when I, whenever I stop and I'm in that period now, yeah. you, you just lean up a lot, particularly around the midsection. Yeah. I'm like, oh, wow, that's, and, and nothing with the diet whatsoever. You just change the alcohol. Just stop drinking the alcohol. And think about the number of people who come home after work and they have a couple glasses of wine. And mm. they're not having a standard five, I think five ounces is a standard glass of wine. <laughs> they're having like, 12 ounces yeah. per, per glass. So that's another piece is people use it to, for stress relief and they don't realize how quickly that calories add up. And I'm, the other thing that I'm, I didn't used to do, but since I've been here, um, I've drank like uh, margaritas. And, and so you've got the, you've, I guess you've got the, the tequila, but then it's like the mixes are probably the worst thing. Cause I always say, oh, I don't drink any kind of, <laughs> uh, what are they called? Sodas or anything, but Yep. There's, there's obviously a lot of that in those as mixes. Yeah, <laughs> you're like you 400 get. calories a pop at least. Right. I do, I do skinny margaritas. <laughs> okay, what's, what's in those? So there? basically club soda, a little agave, and tequila, and fresh lime juice. Right. So drastically. I'm not advocating you guys drink alcohol. I'm just telling you that's what I do to reduce the calories. And apparently, yeah. I, I, is this correct, that it's, it's also really bad if you are going to do it, don't do it with food. Is that, is that correct? With food? Don't don't have alcohol with food. Um, well, if you don't, obviously you can get intoxicated a lot a lot more quickly. But what 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 alcohol also does is it lowers your sort of restraint. So in other words, you're going to be you're going to tend to eat more around yeah. food. I also heard there was something to do with how you, you your food, how it's processed or something that the alcohol seems to sort of have a negative effect on that. I can't remember what it was. Well, but. alcohol has to be metabolized. Okay. It has to be because it gets, otherwise it gets toxic within our system. And so your body will preferentially use your alcohol calories for energy as opposed to, let's say, fast stores or, or something else. Okay. But in, and at the end of the day, what matters is your overall calorie intake. Right. Yeah. So generally, uh, stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> or minimize. Yeah. Right? If you can. And if you're using alcohol to for stress relief, then you know find something fun to do that involves moving your body, or like we were talking about these different cultures that have inherent stress management tools like meditation, or you know, um, you know things in their culture that help them reduce stress, whether that be you know church or some type of spiritual practice or some type of community games, etc. But as a as a population, as a country, we don't, we don't do a good job managing our stress. We do it through dysfunctional ways yeah. in general. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about carbs? They, they, they kind of get a bit of a bad rap. Uh, and yeah. and uh, I'm sure I've even sort of started questioning, uh, question, questioning them. But what, what's, the, what's the role 
if there is one in, uh, in terms of carbs. So you kind of don't go too far in the wrong direction either. Yeah, so the major thing nowadays with carbohydrates, and yes, they get a bad name, is that they're often made into these, what we call ultra processed foods or highly palatable, really good tasting foods. And it's normally a combination of carbohydrates with fat, with salt, <laughs> right? And then packaged. <laughs> And so there, it's really easy to overconsume these high carbohydrate foods. And when you're overconsuming these high carb chips, fries, any type of fast food, any type of pastry, donuts, cookies, crackers, things that people can overeat, right? Then you consume too many calories and it's easier to get overweight. And there's actually a study that's done recently by Dr. Kevin Hall comparing an ultra processed diet with a more of a whole food, whole food diet. And in the study, they actually ate an ultra processed food diet for two weeks, right? And then they took a break and they ate the minimally processed food for two weeks. When people, and they could eat as much as they want, wanted in either case. So when people ate this ultra processed diet, they spontaneously consumed 500 extra calories a day and gained two pounds. And then the opposite happened when they ate the minimally processed diet. They spontaneously consumed 500 calories less and lost two pounds. So when you do a head-to-head -head comparison, right, you look at it, is it carbs? Is it carbs itself that's inherently fattening or is it the fact that it leads to overeating and excess calories? And actually when you do diet comparisons and you look at that body of research, that's, that's what it is. It just leads to excess calorie consumption. It's not carbs by itself, right? It's that it leads to too many, too, to too many calories. And is, is there any ways where you can, um quickly without is, is there any sort of easy ways where you can separate what would be processed from non-processed because it's quite confusing now even when you go in the, things are repackaged to, to look a certain way when they're really not yeah. and you've got to you got to really sort of understand your labels in, yeah. in a lot of cases right so things that are basically not in a container or in a box <laughs> that are on the perimeter of the grocery store so the fruits, the vegetables, the beans, the, you know, you know, those containers that have the rice and the beans that you can buy in bulk, whole grains, all those tend to be your minimally processed foods. And then everything that's in a box or that you get in general from fast food, you know, from takeout tends to be your highly, pro any type of snack food, cookies, donuts, crackers, chips, all those things are the ones that lead to, you know, excess calorie intake. What about breads? I, I, I do like, I think that's my weakness and I do eat good breads, but is there any, yeah. is there anything that you, um, is, is there any sort of good news about bread at all? Yeah. So also, so carbohydrates can make up the bulk of a great diet. Think about vegans, right? <laughs> I mean, they eat mostly carbohydrates. Their protein sources are from grains, beans, lentils, etc. Um, and bread too. So bread is from a grain. And if you're eating whole grain sources, then you're getting a lot of fiber, like minerals, et cetera, um, that your body requires, right? So bread's great. I mean, it can, the foundation of a really, of a really good diet. Yeah. But okay. if you're eating a lot of, um, let's say white bread that is devoid in nutrients. And I'm saying, I mean a lot, like you're, you know, you're eating a lot of it and it's leading to excess calorie intake then yeah, you want to cut back. And if you can switch out some of the minim the more minimally processed breads, like the whole grain type, then you're going to get more nutrients, which is better for your body. But bread in itself, is there's nothing wrong with it at all, unless you're consuming too much of it. <laughs> right? <laughs> which can easily happen with the wine which, and the... <laughs> yes, of course, of course. And so one of the tricks is when if you're going to a restaurant and you know you're going to be over consuming bread, is you tell the server ahead of time, don't bring the bread basket. Mm. Yeah. Proteins, an another s sensitive one. Um, what, what, what are your, what's your thoughts on, on proteins? And then do you have an opinion on the types, animal, plant, um, and everything else in between? Yeah. Um, I, th I believe protein has to be prioritized for everybody. And the RDA, the recommended di dietary allowance for protein, is way too low for optimal health and longevity, including aging. And what we know about the RDAs is that they were designed to prevent deficiency, right? Not optimize health and muscle, muscle health and longevity. 
So the RDA currently is set at 0.36 grams per pound, right? Six, okay. <laughs> Which is way too low, especially if you're trying to lose muscle or gain, or even as you get older. Um, it's pretty much consensus across the board among scientists in this regard. It's not controversial, right? It's you need to get more protein than the RDA, probably at minimal double that, right? To maintain muscle as you get older, because as you age, you lose muscle tissue naturally. Right, starts at 30 if you're sedentary, then it accelerates at 40, then by 50 you're losing it at an even faster rate. It's almost like nature goes, we don't need you anymore, you can go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? And if you don't do something about it, like optimize protein and resistance train, then you're going to lose muscle tissue with age. And then what does that lead to? That leads to weakness, less functional strength. Now you're depending on other people, falls, fractures, lower quality of life. But if you optimize protein and train, you can avoid all that. So what are you recommending in terms of the, 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 the dosage of protein? Yeah, so I think that um, at minimum, we're looking at 0.7 grams per pound of body weight at minimum. And some of the studies have even looked at one and a half grams per pound of body weight um, to optimize fat loss, mm. I think. Which when you, when you actually put that into practice, it, 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 it's quite a bit, isn't it? Well, it is. I, I, I've, 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 I was uh, talking to Gabrielle Leon. I don't know if you, yes, and, and she I know was she saying, is, you know, course. one and a half to two grams per per pound. And I tried to do it, and I'm, I'm sort of, I, I suppose I'm not the typical person because I really take all this stuff seriously all the time yeah. and try experiment. But it was, particularly for trailing, you've got to work a lot to get that that into you. You do, <laughs> and you can kind of understand why. If you did do that, there's not a huge amount of space to do a lot else either. <laughs> Two is pretty high. Yeah. Even one and a half is high. So I, I really like, you know, at least 0.7, maybe up to one. And you do have to be intentional because, the, you know, the average intake of protein in our country at breakfast is like eight to 10 grams. People eat carbs for breakfast. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. So and so, think about what what can people have for breakfast besides eggs and Greek yogurt? I mean, I personally have to add protein into something, whether it's Greek yogurt, oatmeal, or a shake in the morning to get my protein up. Um, and yeah, you do have to be super intentional with with getting your with getting your protein. But most people would benefit from eating more protein and less carbs or fat. Mm. They would instantly improve their diet if they did that. Coming up next. If you're dieting too long and too hard for extended period of time, yeah, you can, it can lead to that fat overshooting. Sports nutrition, to your point, is about fueling. You have to move with real intention. I ended up falling in love with nutrition and how nutrition can impact the body, whether it's weight management or sports performance. I do find that if you do prioritize it, then you, you naturally just, you, you're quite full, really. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, it is pretty filling. Uh, I, I find so. So when you mentioned breakfast, then what would be, what would be a, a good time, and then uh, a sort of a, a good breakfast in terms of meeting those protein needs? So, and do you, do you look at those meals per? Okay, well, if you have your breakfast, this is sort of how much protein I think you should kick off with. Yeah, yeah. So in general, you know, practically speaking, you know, one to two palm sized portions of protein per meal across three to four meals a day. That's and what would that be as a, as yeah. a so, gram? Um, that would be about, that would match basically your body size if you did that, right? Because right. everybody's hand is typically proportional to their body size. So for females, about one. For guys, it would be closer to two per meal, palm sized portions per meal. That would be the, the, about the 0.7. Okay. If you will. I mean, of course we could break each food source and, uh, and look at the grams per, you know, a protein per food source and do that. But that's from a practical standpoint. Yeah. And what would you be getting though in terms of grams? Yeah. So like, things? so an egg is like seven grams of protein, right? A tub of Greek yogurt is um, like maybe 12 to 15. So in general, if you did it by weight, like for me, I'm 126 pounds. Um, so I need about a hundred grams a day. So if, we, if you divide that, you know, into four meals a day, you're looking at 25. Right. Around about 25 per for, yeah. for, your, for your first meal. And when are you, right. and are, are you, have you got any views about when you should have that first meal? Um, In relation to when you wake. It depends on who you're talking to and what the, what, you know, what the scientists say. There's no real ideal time to have that. Um, except if you're a performance athlete, 
if you're a performance athlete and you have to train, then in general you want to have it around your workout time, you know. Um, but it's a, it, could fit, it could be anything. It could be within a, a fast, what you're following a, a fast and you want to eat it within that window. It could be eat a big breakfast meal. It just depends on what you're trying to achieve and who you are. Mm. Yeah. So with that fasting, what, what, what's your views on, let's say, a 24-hour fast, the intermittent or, or some kind of time-restricted eating? Have you, have you found – like I've, 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 I've been doing a time-restricted eating, 16-8 which I, I think it works quite well for, for my lifestyle because of the way I work. I eat less because even when I'm traveling and even if I get in late, it's like, okay, I've passed my time for eating. So normally you'd probably get something and because I've got that, that sort of upper and lower limit, I put everything in between. And so generally um, I'm not eating at times where I'd be tempted to snack and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, but do you have any views on any of those kind of restricted or intermittent fasting? I do. And so when you look at the research around uh, fasting, and as you said, there's different forms of fasting. There's 24 hour, four hour fasting. There's, um, you know, they call it alternate day fasting. Eat, day, eat, eat a day, then don't eat a day. And then there, within a day, there's time restricted eating where you restrict eating within a certain window. And the major benefit to fasting, regardless of type, is that people tend to reduce their calorie intake by around 20 to 25% when they adopt one of these types of fasting. That's the main benefit mm. that you'll see. And so it's a great weight management tool for individuals that can adhere to that, right? Now, in our country, people eat typically across a 15-hour time frame from their first, you know, calorie intake with maybe cream in their coffee to the last bites. It tends to be pretty big window. And so then if you restrict it down to eight hours, you can see how it would reduce people's calorie intake. So for people who don't want to be told what to eat, they don't want to change their eating habits, they just want to lose weight and try to do a simple way to do that, it's a good idea for them to let restrict their eating and then they're going to do what you do. They're not going to eat as much. Mm. And then they're going to reduce their calorie intake and then they're going to lose weight. Do you recommend doing like a once a month or a certain amount of times a year where you do some uh, like a longer fast to as a because and the reason I ask that is I've sort of experimented with that and I do find that once you've actually been through it psychologically it's like well if it almost sort of resets your willpower I feel because you've mm. done that so it's like okay well now I can be if, I mean, I've got through just looking at food and not eating anything. So anything now is, is, is you seem to have more self-control. I, I do. Yeah. I don't yeah. know whether you've seen or experienced that at all. So I, you know, obviously fasting has been part of certain cultures for a long, long time. Um, I don't know that it's been studied um, where long, long duration fastings or water fasting had specific physiological benefits or psychological benefits to them. I don't, I'm not familiar if there's been studies on that or not. I think the closest thing we know is in rodent research where a lot of the, the fasting and the physiological benefits are studied. When they're given a time restricted eating plan, well, their metabolism is way different than ours. So when you restrict rats to like eating, you know, I don't know, within an eight hour window, it's like several days in their physiology. And they'll see a lot of benefits physiologically in rodents. I don't know that it translates to humans because I don't know that it's been studied, you know, but to your point, if it helps you, like you feel a benefit, you psychologically get a benefit, why not? Hmm. Do, does it? Do you, how, you mentioned the speed of your metabolism. Like, yeah. do, could if you're doing intermittent or any kind of fasting, could that slow your metabolism down because you're not getting the amount of food, and then cause you to hold on to fat, for example? No, no. What tends to happen when you look at the research is, you know, when people restrict calories severely, you know, their metabolism will flex. You know, it's called metabolic adaptation. It'll probably downregulate 10% or so. The longer or so, the longer they restrict calories, or they're more severely they restrict calories, then it flexes even, even further. Um, and then it can lead to what's called fat overshooting. And Not we saw this that. in the Biggest Loser studies, where obviously the Biggest Losers from that show they restricted calories severely for a long time, right? And they did like crazy amounts of exercise. 
Well, when you did follow up, when they did the follow up studies on these individuals, what they found was that a lot of them gained more weight than before. And it was until they restored their lean body mass that they had lost. And so it might have to do with the fact that the body wants to restore the lean mass, maybe it has to do with survival. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Um, but in general, if you're reducing calories slightly, let's say 10 to 20% of your calories, your body's not going to like do some massive shift and like make you gain extra weight. You know, if you're doing that for a short period of time or here and there, but if you're dieting too long and too hard <laughs> for extended period of time, yeah, you can, it can lead to that fat overshooting. Yeah, and, that, and that, that, that's probably like your body compensating in yeah. some way then. If your strength training is becoming quite popular now for both yes. men and women, yes. uh, which, which, is, which is great. Which is uh, awesome. What's the advice that you've got for people that have figured that out, they're starting a strength training program? What are some of the key things that they need to do to adjust their diet to, to deal with that type of change? Yeah, so... Um, if, we're, if you're just starting a workout routine, obviously you have to have adequate calories. And in most cases, people do, right? They step in the gym, they're not emaciated, <laughs> right? They're not, they're at a healthy body weight. So if you're trying to lean down, then you're gonna have to put yourself in a slight deficit in order to get leaner, if that's what your goal is. So where can you shave off two, 300 calories in your diet that's sustainable um, if you're trying to get leaner? And then where can you optimize your protein intake? So if you're not eating any protein at breakfast, you're eating a little bit of lunch and hardly any, or maybe your biggest dose at dinner, where can you maybe get more in to get closer to that one to two palm sizes per meal or 0.7 grams per pound of body weight? So those are the two changes I would say to start off with, right? Like, and you know what's great for that? Our high protein meal replacement shakes. Because think about people in the morning, they're busy. They don't want to think about it. Maybe they skip breakfast. Well, if you consume, right, a high protein meal replacement shake that gives you a good 25, 30 grams in the morning, you're automatically increasing your protein intake. It could help with your hunger levels. As you said, it naturally suppresses your appetite and it's a con calorie control mechanism. So, and the studies have actually shown that when people consume one to two high protein meal replacement shakes in place of their normal meals, they actually lose more weight than people just counting calories or following a calorie restricted diet. So that's an easy switch. I can mm. do a meal replacement shake, right, in the morning and maybe another one in the afternoon instead of the vending machine or the break room or whatever you're doing. And not only are you going to shave off calories, but you're going to increase protein. So what a, a minor tweak to your routine, but huge benefit. With strength training, I noticed that even if I change the intensity, you do get very hungry mm -hmm. quite quickly. Yeah. And, and I guess that's probably where you say, oh, strength training didn't work. <laughs> I ended up eating more. Yeah, so you want to front load your strength training with carbs. That's where you want to have your heavier carbohydrate meals, right? Because that's what your muscles rely on. It's its major energy source. And then if you're trying to get lean, you want to get high volume, low calorie food. So big salads, lots of veggies, mm. right? Do you, is that just on that carb thing then? That's an interesting point. Do you, do you think that can be the mistake sometimes people make. Because my guess is when you're doing when you're doing that type of strength training, you, your muscles need the energy. Yep. Um, so, and, and if people are saying, well, I don't need carbs and I'm just having protein, is that, is, is there a careful balance to say, well, look, you've got to get some good protein in because your muscles are going to need it. Don't just knock it out because you, because that might sort of set you off in a direction you don't want to go. Yeah, I mean, for sure. So again, your muscles are reliant on carbohydrates during, you know, when you're training hard. That's the primary fuel source it relies upon, right? It's gonna deplete those stores depending how long you go with your training. Um, and then you need to have the protein afterwards to replenish and to recover. And not necessarily right after, but at least meet your daily requirement within, you know, within a reasonable time. What's your recommendation about the window of finishing the workout and having protein? That's, that's something I see people seem to yeah. have different opinions on. Have you got any science that backs up? Uh, There's a bunch of science on the anabolic window and a lot of old scientists say it's a lot bigger than we used to think. You know, So what's most important is that you hit your total dose within a 24 hour period. That, that's the most important thing. Unless you're an athlete or an exerciser and you exercise intensely or you do endurance type events. Why? Because you're gonna deplete your muscle glycogen stores and if you're relying upon those muscle glycogen stores for the next training bout, you have to replenish. 
And so your body replenishes glycogen stores more efficiently, effectively, closer to when you finished your workout. So it's really a carb thing, not a protein thing, <laughs> right? Because right? again, if you're emptying your gas tank, you got you to you put it back in and your body does optimize replenishing glycogen post-workout the best. So would you say then that the, because uh, one of the things I was gonna talk about is sleep, which I know impacts weight loss as well mm -hmm. and stress. Mm -hmm. So w would you say then, based on what we're saying, you, you, you could end up getting involved in a program if you're not getting, the, you, you, if you're not refueling your muscles and you're probably not sleeping right, you could end up uh, um, gaining weight because you know you're tired and then you either you're eating you're forcing yourself to eat the wrong food so you're kind of you're competing against yourself to keep those good habits i yeah. guess i guess if you've not been working out for a long time some of the things you're saying I, I could see how somebody may be able to slip into a place where they've just got their food wrong yeah doing a good strength program got mm -hmm. their food wrong and then they they can't stick to it and um they're not refueling they're not recovering and and you you could end up in a worst place than maybe what you was at the beginning. Yeah, and not just that, but also from an uh, immune system standpoint, if you're not sleeping yeah, right, that's the other thing, right? Yeah. and you're not getting adequate protein, well, your body's going to prioritize. Obviously, muscle's not the top priority in the body. It's not. It's your immune system and all your enzymes and things that require your metabolism to just keep going. So, you know, a lot of things can be compromised if you're not sleeping, you're stressed out, you're not getting enough nutrients, including protein, and you can get in a little bit of a funk, if you will, you know, training and not fueling properly. So we got to dial that in. And that's why I think it's so important for um, fitness professionals to learn about nutrition. We were talking before we started about this, the, the, the fitness industry, and, and uh, I suppose um, education is extremely important because I, I guess if you're working with a trainer that kind of has a bit of information, you know, maybe they've done a good workshop on one thing, but then you're kind of getting some advice which has been picked up from somewhere else. You, you can very easily, um, yeah, you, you can very easily get, as you say, get yourself in, as, as a client, get yourself in a worse position. And, and I suppose that isn't good for, <laughs> it's good for the industry that we're no. in really. And I, I, I kind of see why so many people could get frustrated with uh, going to gyms or going to trainers because of the the sort of maybe slightly with good intention but incorrect advice that they may be getting. Absolutely. So when clients join the gym for the first time, most of them are there to lose weight, right? Do we agree? 15, yeah, 20 yeah. pounds. That's my experience. And what moves the needle the most in regards to weight management is nutrition. But in the client's mind, what do they think? They're like, I'm going to join the gym and I'm going to do what to lose weight? Exercise, cardio. Cardio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they think it's cardio. Yeah. And so they're in there killing themselves doing exercise they most likely don't like, right? And they're not seeing results. Maybe they get a trainer and maybe the trainer isn't versed in nutrition or doesn't understand the role it plays. And the trainer's designing these awesome workouts for the client. The client's not seeing results. What does the client do? Uh, leaves. Leaves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> or get me a new trainer, yeah. right? Well, yeah. It's not working. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lose-lose for everybody, mm. for the trainer and the client. And you're also going to be, if you, know, if you are doing that for a period of time, you are probably, you're obviously clearly going to be tired and then you're going to be clearly looking to, sub, to get that energy in, in somewhere um, yeah. without, that's why it's funny, you know, like I know, obviously I know what, what you and Neil have done for many years and how successful that's been. Um, and Neil's mentioned to me a number of times on, on his system and just amazes me that, that that isn't extremely common by now. It is. And I think one of the reasons why is because the system isn't set up for trainers to be forced to be educated in nutrition, right? Think about it. When a trainer becomes a trainer, what do they have to do? They go on a certification course, a fitness Correct. instructor and a personal trainer. Does it have anything trainer. to do with nutrition? <laughs> well, I've never, I've not done it. I don't, I don't think so. No, no, okay. it doesn't. Right. So, that's part of the system is they're not educated or they're not forced to Why is get educated. Why do you think the, the, that's not part of a, of, of a sort of fitness instru instructor or personal trainer certification? 
Is there some is there some specific reasons why they? I, I, I think it's philosophy as as a personal trainer. You know, the definition of being a personal trainer is being an exercise expert, if you will. Like you're an expert in exercise as opposed to weight management and body composition change. But oh. the problem is you got to know your personnel. You got to know your clientele. The mm-hmm. average person walking in wants weight management. <laughs> yeah. So it's a conundrum, right? It is, yeah. It's yeah, a conundrum. They're, they're, you're trained to be a trainer and to be versed in exercise program design, et cetera, but the client wants to lose weight. Mm. Well, if, <laughs> well, not, well not, not, even if not necessarily lose weight, you know, if they're an athlete, like you could, you could choose a whole number of sort of demographics, but yeah. ultimately to do that, there's a fuel source, which I know they talk about because I, right. I did do the... Yeah theory on on the the, per, the personal trainer course they, they t- touch into that but they i suppose the bit that seems to miss out is okay well what is they tell you how it works and how it how it processes and but how do you so, implement yeah, right. so, yeah how do you implement you know i will say though matthew in my career as a trainer um i would say out of let's say 100 clients that i had maybe five were athletes that came in strictly no, I, I agree with if what you're that. saying. Yeah, I, I agree. Right? Yeah. The, 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 the bulk of the market is people that want to get fit. I, yeah. It was more okay, so I was just saying that it, it does apply, though, to anybody. It does anybody. apply across the board. Yeah, point. yeah. It, it does apply. And that's what I got a degree in, is in sports nutrition. Right. Right? And then after I got a degree in sports nutrition, I had to do additional education on weight management. <laughs> Would you recommend, if you're, if you're searching for a trainer, that you've got someone that probably has an element of like a, a sports nutrition background as well as a, as a physical thing. Not necessarily sports nutrition because sports nutrition to your point is about fueling, proper fueling, proper optimization of, you know, for whatever activity it is, recovery, et cetera. Whereas a general population, like a trainer is mostly going to be working with gen pop that wants to lose that 15 or 20 pounds. So I would say I'd look for a trainer that's a good trainer in terms of exercise design, has a good credential, and then also has um, some education or credential around nutrition. And there's some good ones that are out there. When you, when you think about gyms then, like, like what you've just said, that majority of people want to come in there to lose weight, the yeah. bulk, um, they want to lose about 10 to 15 pounds. Yeah. Um, you would have thought that the first person, they, that you'd have thought that instead of fitness instructors and trainers, you would have on the team, you'd have nutri- your nutrition people your instructors and your PTs and yep. you would kind of, okay, yep. well, you want to go here first because right. this is, what, what is, is there, a, is there, if, if you want to get somebody who's not, um, who's out of shape, who wants to lose a pound, it wants to lose 15 pounds. Is there a percentage from your experience of, of what percentage is down to your diet and nutrition and what is it from the exercise? Is that, is there any way of like, or can you, could you have a guess of what that is? Um, I would say that it could be 100% because if you're training super duper hard, but you're eating too many calories, your body composition is not going to change. Now, you're going to get benefits because exercise inherently has a ton of benefits. We all know that. But in terms of your weight and your body composition, um, it's not going to (laughs) change. Have we not seen that? Well, yeah. People that go to the gym every (laughs) single day, they look exactly the same. For years and years and years and years, mm. right? Why are they not changing? It's not that they're not exercising. Uh-huh. They're not tweaking their, their nutrition. You think, I think if I'm going to open a gym, I'm going to open a gym and I'm, and it's, <laughs> and I'm not going to, you, right, you don't work out. You, we're going to go for a walk, which <laughs> right. you all like, and you're going to sit with this lady here and she's going to get your diet sorted out. And I yeah, guarantee you this. That was first initial thing was <laughs> Apex Fitness was a, a, a tech, a nutrition tech who met with all the clients to get on a plan and then they would go train with a different trainer. That was the initial model. Really? Now the model is everybody learns nutrition, but not everybody does. Not everybody takes it on. I mean, it's, you have to move with real intention, right? You do, you can't mm-hmm. just be the, un, unless you're, you could, you have the privilege of strictly doing performance and training and your client does not, News, knows everything they need to know about nutrition, right? And they don't need you to know about nutrition. Mm. Yeah, that would, what do you, so do you think that would work? People would come in and pay like, you know, 30 or 40, 50 bucks a month and just sit down with you like two or three times a week and go for a walk. And <laughs> I mean, I, I think that if they're- And we guarantee, we'll give you your money back if you don't, if you don't lose your weight. For sure. I mean, 
So, so we try to get trainers to do that through our system is let's get you, you don't have to think about how to do a nutrition plan. Um, we'll do it for you and you just have to learn how to deliver it. Mm. Right. You have to learn how to deliver it, talk about it, execute. But again, that takes, you know, that takes intention and practice and tenacity to do mm. that. Yeah, that'd do me out of a job, actually, you now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> but you need to use escape equipment, you know, that's the only thing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to come on to a few things, meals. Like, we've talked about breakfast. Yes. And, um, and, and we've covered that one. But there's, what are your thoughts about office food? People go into, well, although they don't go into the office quite as much, but when you go into the office, there's not always the ability to get what you want. And my guess is that could also be an opportunity even with good intentions where you slip off the rail. So what's your advice about your sort of how to stay on track mm -hmm. when you go to, to the office? Yeah. So if you see it, you're going to be influenced to eat it. So avoid it at all costs, the stuff that's around there. If you have to not pass by the desk that has all the candy, if you have to avoid the break room, right? You, you don't expose yourself. That's really the main thing. Same thing in your house. If you constantly have junk food around, you're going to eat it, right? But if you act, there's actually studies on this stuff. Like if you have all the healthy foods around your refrigerator stock, you're going to eat what's in front of you for the most part, as long as you don't hate it, right? You somewhat enjoy it. So avoid, um, and then do a little bit of planning, be proactive. So what are you going to have and in the office that you can consume that is healthy and convenient. If you have a bowl of apples or if you have oatmeal and, you know, protein powder in your, in your desk, things that are convenient and healthy and fit your plan, then you're going to be more, more likely to, to stick to it. So avoid the junk and do, do a little bit of planning and have the good stuff around. What about when you're, let's say you're on the road, you drive a lot or you're traveling, yep. going on a flight. Yep. Airports are terrible, getting delays. Are, are there any things that you do to, um, to, to keep that in check? Yes, so I travel a lot, so I'm good at this. <laughs> um, in my backpack, I always have bars, nuts, um, and protein powder. So I always have that stuff, and I carry a shaker bottle, and I, sometimes I have packets of oatmeal for the, for the you know, hotel room. And so breakfast is oatmeal, you know, sometimes they have a microwave, heat up the water, put a scoop of protein powder, sh sh sh, throw in some nuts. There you go. That's my breakfast. Or it's a bar. And a lot of times the hotels will have a bowl of fruit and I grab a piece of fruit or from the, from the breakfast bar and a piece of fruit, you know, that type of thing. In an airport, it's easy. There's so many choices nowadays. Salad with a piece of protein, go to. That's, but again, if you're too hungry because you skipped your meal, <laughs> Yeah, that right. you're going to not eat the salad with a piece of protein. You're going to eat the Cinnabon and the burger and fries because you skipped your meal because mm. you weren't prepared, right? Yeah. yeah. So a little bit of planning goes a long way. And when you go to a restaurant yep. uh, and you're with, you've been invited, you're with other people, I, I, how would you look at the menu without kind of being totally boring and say, oh, I have a salad, but or, or is, that, or is that what you do? <laughs> My friends actually make fun of me because I am pretty predictable and boring. Um, but, you know, that's the 80-20 rule, right? Like 80% of the time you're on track, you know what you're doing, you, you follow your plan and your strategy, and then 20% of the time you get, to, you get to play and, you know, eat at a restaurant, not worry about it. That's really more of my approach is that I'm really consistent in my approach. And then when I do go out with friends, I'll, I'll eat whatever I want. Mm. Yeah. How, how have you found things? Have you, have you been using any of these trackers, like Levels one I've used in the past, which is quite interesting. I think more just demonstrating because you have to take a picture and you look at your scores and it's, it's quite a good way of showing you actually how much things you eat that you didn't realize you eat, number one. And then when it links it into your glucose, I, I found that also quite a surprise because things that I thought were good for me, according to my view, were, were, were different on the, on, on, on the app. So uh, what, do you, what do you think about things like levels and is there any other nutritional trackers that you've used that you found are quite successful? Are you referring to like a continuous glucose monitor? Right, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think for the overall vast majority of people, it's probably a little bit too much right now with the technology where it is like reacting to your, cause your blood sugar is supposed to spike after you eat. <laughs> like it's supposed to go up and then it's supposed to go down. And, 
And, you know, if you don't have diabetes, if you don't have any issues with your blood glucose, I'm not sure how practically useful it is at this point. What's more useful is people becoming aware of their eating habits and becoming aware of what their body needs. So for instance, um, taking pictures of everything you eat. I mean, it's powerful. And then if you talk to somebody who knows nutrition, knows what they're doing, they can give you good feedback about it. That's more powerful than a continuous glucose monitor, in right. my opinion, because mm -hmm. you're gonna be like, with my clients, I'm like, all right, everything you're eating, you're gonna send to me for, for, the, for the next week. No judgment, it's just data for me. I'm just looking at it going, this is what you're eating, how do we tweak it based on what you're trying to achieve, right? And it starts to build awareness. They're like, oh damn, I didn't know tequila had 130 calories per, right? per shot. Or I didn't know this you know, snack I was eating was eight servings in it and I thought it was just one. So that type of thing is really useful because it's building their knowledge base around food and how their, how the, their food choices impact their requirements and their goals. And then when I teach them, well, your body burns around you know, 2,000 calories a day. This is how much you've been eating. Then they're like, oh, so it's all about choices. If they know their body's requirements and they start building up their knowledge of food and food choices, then they're empowered to make better decisions. That to me is a lot more useful than seeing my blood sugar go up and down based on the food yeah. that they're eating, right? And then a lot of people for, tra for tracking wise, the average, I think in our country, the average step count um, per day is around less than 5,000 steps. Yeah, I can believe that. Yeah. And that has a huge impact on your calorie intake for the day, on how much you can actually eat. So if we can get people aware of how much they're sitting and get them to move more throughout the day and monitor their steps throughout the day and give them a target to hit throughout the day, they're in control of how they do it. Do you wanna go up and down your stairs? Do you wanna walk around your neighborhood? Do you wanna go in the mall? And But well, we just need you to get your steps up to whatever the amount is. That, to me, is an empowering way to use tracking. I did, the, that point you mentioned just made me think something about when I was using levels. The, um, I, I, I'm, of, I'm quite competitive and so I'm always trying to kind of get the scores and that was probably the main thing for me. But the two, the two takeaways was one, when you have to actually take a picture every time you put something in your mouth. Made me realize how many times I am putting things in my mouth, which you kind of awareness. don't... Awareness, yeah, yeah, that was the first thing. The second one is how certain things that you do think are reasonably healthy just can blow it for, for quite a long time. And you think, damn, you know, that <laughs> won't come out. I was surprised about that. I thought it was super healthy. More awareness. Yeah, more awareness. And the third <laughs> one was the impact of going out for a walk after eating and how that can stabilize. Even if yes. I have, like, I like a, an ice cream at the weekend and, and things. And if you have an ice cream and go and sit go on the beach, walk. for example, and don't do anything, compared to have it and then go on a long walk, yes. totally different. Totally different. Um, and, and those are small things, but you're right. I, I, I guess if you, the aware, having the awareness, I think is yes. a big thing. Yeah. Even if you think you know it, you, right. you probably don't. Well, that's a good way to use it then. I, I like that, that you use it that way, as you see the impact of your movement and how it can regulate your blood, blood sugars that way. But you're right, it can, I, I guess it can be, it can be a little bit much, but it, it, it was it was an interesting it's an interesting thing to do. I think right, right. Uh, a few times because you, um, yeah, you learn you learn quite a, quite a lot about food, and um, and then next time when you do it, you you at least think twice before. You at least think twice, exactly. And that's what <laughs> the actual food tracking does is it adds that accountability, that mm. layer of accountability. It's like, well, now I know how this is going to impact my calorie total, my blood sugar and then you make a better choice, mm. or at least an informed choice. <laughs> yes, exactly. We were talking about children. You've got, you're a mum, a couple of uh, yeah. small, well, not, not small, big actually, very big children. <laughs> <laughs> and you must have had to- One that, One's texting me right now as we speak, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've, you, you must have been for an interesting um, journey with them in terms of food. So what, 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 if, what are you, what, I'm, I'm at a stage now where we're yeah. trying to get good breakfast for them. Yeah. They, they, they do sports and so they, they burn stuff, but there's also this temptation, which I think we're starting to break, but temptation to sort of eat the quick and fast things. Um, and the, the meals I think are important um, is 
and my wife talks about this, is, is the breakfast, what do they have before they go to school? And then the meal at school, so they don't come home absolutely starving and then eat just eat, eat everything that they can get their, their, their hands on. <laughs> so what would you say about those two things? Well, I think first and foremost with kids is they watch what you do and not what you say. So it's important to be a good model. And they lag behind. So they're going to go for the, you know, the poor choices, especially as younger, if they have access to that. So it's important to the, for the environment, right, to control your environment if you can and not give them access to all kinds of junk food. Um, but then as they get older, they adopt the healthy eating habits as they get older and more mature, right? So that was my biggest revelation because I'm almost an empty nester. I will be officially an empty <laughs> nester this weekend. <laughs> right. Now... You can't always force kids to eat, but if you can make it tasty and convenient for them, they'll do it. They'll more, be more likely to do it. So things that work for my kids are like, you know, I would make protein shakes with some chocolate syrup and banana in it to get them to eat it, especially, you know, at times around practices where they are starving and they need something. And so I, they need a whole bunch of calories. So if you can do that with made breakfast, it could be something as simple as, you know, waffle with peanut butter and chocolate milk, you know, things that are going to give them nutrients, but it doesn't have to be perfect. So that's an interesting point. I just want to stick on that. So what you're saying then, because I'm, I've, I've done the protein shakes and all this mm -hmm. stuff, but sometimes I don't like the taste and um, I've never... You're eating the wrong protein shake. Well, yeah. And, I, and I'm wondering, <laughs> okay, do I stick like a half, because when I used, when I was a bodybuilder years ago, I used to put yeah. ice cream in my protein yeah. shakes. So I'm thinking, well, do I tell them I'm going to put a half a scoop of that in there to get them to do the shake. Are you saying, yeah. and then that's, a, that's kind of okay? Yeah, but you don't need to do ice cream. I, or, or I didn't whatever, have but... to, but I, you know, like peanut butter, extra calories, you know, chocolate syrup to make it taste a little bit better. They, growing kids need the extra calories, especially if they're athletes, mm. right? Mm. Like the last thing you want your athlete to do is to lose weight as they're, as they're working out. Many of them do because they don't get enough calories to your point. So yeah, make it taste good. Something that they like, just Something put a bit of that like, in there as yeah. a bit of a carrot. Yeah, and, uh, and let them do it too. Like, let them participate. What do you want to put in your shake? The more, you know, that they participate, the more likely they are to do it. Same thing with snacks. Give them choices, um, you know, that like, like to choose. What, what do you want to put in your backpack for your snack? Don't, the more you try to force things on them, they're, they're going to be resistant to mm -hmm. it. But if you give them good choices and they enjoy it, then they're more likely to do it. You know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are great for that, you know, in their backpack with a banana or, or whatever. Um, but what you described was like the typical kid. They skip breakfast, they eat crap or nothing at, at school, and then afterwards they're starving. They're starving. I mean, it's just, I don't know. That. We try as best as we can, right? But again, they're kids and they have all access to all kinds of junk food that you can't control at school. So be a good model and get, let them have choices and make things test, taste good so that they do it. My last question to you then. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. Ooh. Outside of bringing up your two children yeah. <laughs> and being an empty nester this weekend, <laughs> what, what would be a memorable example of escaping your own personal limits? This is a loaded question. Um, my own personal limits. Well, I will say that I never thought I would be in the fitness industry. I went into college trying to become a athletic trainer. That's what my undergrad is in. Then a physical therapist, um, and maybe even an orthopedic surgeon because I loved anatomy, et cetera. Um, and so I ended up falling in love with nutrition and how nutrition can impact the body, whether it's weight management or sports performance. And so I will say that if you have an open mind, that you can achieve a very fulfilling career in fitness if you're willing to, like I said, have an open mind. I love fitness. I love that I'm here and I'm able to help and influence fitness professionals. And I didn't think that I ever would. So I don't know if that's answering your question directly, but that's my There's answer. There's no right or wrong answer on that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what, now, now your, your children have left, like what, what, are you, um, what, what are some of the things that you've got on your, on your list today? That, that was definitely a limit. Being a parent, I mean, it's the hardest thing that I have ever done. So that's, being a parent pushed me beyond any limit I ever <laughs> thought that I would have. No, seriously, that's, that's really what it is. It's being a parent. Um, I never wanted kids. 
I sort of had them, but I didn't know that I wanted them. And they shifted my soul in such a way that it opened me up to be a better person. And so now that they're on their own, I would say being a parent is second is 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 probably most fulfilling. And then secondarily, it's being able to to work in fitness. Fantastic. Well, Kat, thank you very much. Yeah. I've learned a lot today. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've got any value from it whatsoever, then please do us a favor, like, subscribe, tell somebody, and that will help us to be able to continue to do more of these and help you escape your own personal limits. Thanks for listening.